Good morning, church. It's my honor and joy to once again get up here and welcome you. I clearly didn't mess it up too much last time. But I have to admit, when Mark asked me last week what I was going to introduce with and, and to, to do it, I was thinking, I have not a clue. I mean, even right up to last night, not a clue. But I was going through all the pictures on my phone because uh, I get a few thousand of them from my nephew. And I was sat watching, absolutely overjoyed at this little boy sat on the floor, giggling and making a joyful noise. Completely incoherent, makes no sense at all. But it's such a joyful thing. And God said, if you find watching that little boy, isn't your little boy, he's your nephew, making a joyful noise on the floor, and quite a bit of mess, how much more... How much more do I feel hearing you make a joyful noise in my name? Now, I don't know about you, but one of the, some of the times I felt closest to God is in worship, whether it be a fast song, a lively song, somewhere in between. It's always one of the things that I enjoy the most. So I don't know about you, but hopefully that's just put a little bit of perspective. And as we're about to move into worship, I hope that you will... Join me in seeking a, a, a close time with God this morning. And hopefully I've got all my buttons in the right order so this will work.
church great is his faithfulness i love those words now as a life group we've been looking at the fruits of the spirit which are love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control and these are guidances for us to live by and the theme that runs through the bible is love we love because god first loved us and he sent his son to die for us and pay the price for our sin so everything that we have comes from God, whether it be the clothes we wear, the shoes on our feet, the food on our table, the air that we breathe. Everything comes from God and he graciously gives it to us. So we're to show that love to others, to be his hands and feet in this fallen, hurting world. Blessing someone you've never met and you will never meet is showing God's love. So please fill a shoebox for those less fortunate than us in Romania, Moldova, Ukraine and Bulgaria. These people are very poor and often live in huts and run-down buildings. This is how we're being, God shows his faithfulness. He uses us. We are his hands and feet. So by filling a box with practical items, toiletries, hats, gloves, scarves, things for the children, colouring books, pencils, cars, yo-yos, dolls, cuddly toys, sweets and chocolate, things that will entertain a child 
probably for hours out there because these children are so used to the simple things. They don't expect a screen to entertain them like our children do. They're happy with the simple things. And so you will bless these children more than you can imagine. So if you would fill a box either for a family for, or for the elderly, they need to be ready by the 5th of November, which is only two and a half weeks away. You need £3 with each box of transport costs. There's empty boxes and there's leaflets with guidance of what to put in them in the foyer as well for you. Um, if you'd like me to fill a box for you, plenty of you have asked me, and thank you very much, and anyone else, please come and see me after the service. But you will get, I get so much pleasure out of filling a box, and I hope you can share that pleasure too, knowing how much it's going to bless somebody else. So thank you. Good morning. Good morning. i just put my water there before I... <laughs> It's good to see you in church this morning, it's good to see you online. I've just got some thoughts that I'd like to share with you this morning on how good our God is. Do, do you know, I, I came down this morning very early, and it was pretty dark. It's dark in the mornings, isn't it? And as I came downstairs, I stubbed my toe on a few things, and, and that can be painful too. But it, a verse of scripture came to me, and it was that the word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. I think it's in one of the Psalms. And uh, I, I thought about that for a few minutes. And yes, isn't it so often that, you know, we're in church, we listen to things, and we listen to Len speaking, and we read our Bibles, and the Word of God comes to our mind, and it directs us in our path. One of the words that is a focus that I'm speaking on is, is in Psalm 23. And I'd just like to go through that. Sometimes Psalm 23 is used at funerals, and sad events, but this was uh, given to David, wasn't it? I can just imagine him sat among the fields and with the sheep and, and sort of, I think of Paul Johnson too about the sheep as well. And, uh, but anyway, Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. And he leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his own name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and staff comfort me. You preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You'll, you'll get to know soon the word, what comes out of that book. You know, parts of that says that we have all we need. We have all we need. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. What one, uh, one translation says, he lets me rest. I, I'm not too good at resting. I like to be on the go and doing things, and, uh, but he lets me rest. And I will not be afraid. He prepares a feast. And then it said, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. And another word for surely in the Bible, I believe in a translation, is certainly. Certainly. It's for certain that goodness and mercy and his faithfulness, and we will live in the house of the Lord forever. So the first word that I'd like to really speak about is restoration. And in Psalm 23, he restores my soul. You know, in the Bible, when it ever talks about restoration, it's always in abundance. It's more than enough. And I'm just glad this morning that our God is more than enough for us. God's promise to, is, to us is that there's a better way. There's a better way to walk. There's a better life. And there's a better future for ourselves and our loved ones. Yes, God's promise to us is restoration in abundance. In, often in better in the Bible, it also says that the latter state would be better than the, the beginning. In Joel 2.21, it goes on about restoring with the canker worm and the... And we've been through a troubled time of like a plague, really. And, uh, but the word comes out to me, and I will restore the years. I believe, in a way, this is a prophecy for somebody either here this morning or for somebody online as well, that God will restore the years. We, as life, go through trials and tribulations, but God can restore the years. 
he is more than enough. And in that song we've just sang, he has never failed us yet. I just love the fact that over my 64 years, that God has never failed me yet. I know I've failed him, but he's always been there to, to lift me up and to... And, you know, the key is, as, uh, as Ryan started was, with us to, be, to rejoice and to be happy. Restore means to bring back to the formula condition of something that was in a place before. I don't really watch the programme, but I was watching a programme and it was called The Repair Shop. And people would take things in, precious memories which were tatty. Um, now, I remember one, this guy bought a, a, a railway lamp in and half the glass was missing and it was red glass and the, it had been painted some horrible colour and it should have been black. And these guys did a fantastic job and so they restored it back to what it probably was like before, or even better probably, than what it was before. You know, also under the law of Moses and, and the old days, so if somebody stole a sheep or an oxen, they had to give four back. So we, we just know that God's uh, provision is to do better. I remember Job, the trials that Job went through, and the, uh, the, the, the problems that he had and family, but you know, God restored to him and repaid him double. These are kingdom rules, not human rules. And I think that's the thing that we need to remember, that kingdom rules bring life, regeneration, and prosperity. And this is what I believe is happening to the church and to you as well in faith. Let's be faith that this will happen. Would you do something, preachers used to do this from time to time, and you're wondering what I'm going to get you to do now, but uh, would you say to your neighbour, look what the Lord has done, and look what the Lord will do. <laughs> you know, as restoration, uh, Joseph was a, a good example of restoration. I did pinch this from somebody, but there was four F's in, in Joseph's story, and the first one was that he was forsaken. You might feel forsaken here this morning. You might feel all alone, but God is good, and he will come back to you. You may have been falsely accused, which Joseph was, falsely accused, and sometimes misunderstood for your best meaning actions, and forgotten. You might feel forgotten sometimes. I just imagine, I remember years ago, they used to do strange things at school, such as country dancing, and you'd all be in the, in the hall, and the guys would be down one side, and the girls would be down there, but they would pick. And it, uh, I don't know that I was the last, but I, <laughs> do you ever feel that you're sort of forgotten? But he endured, so we mustn't quit. Um, have I bought it? Have I left it down there? Yeah. There's a poem here, um, and I'm only going to read part of it. Uh, I always think of Jan, actually, when we... I don't know why for poems... Oh, I've got some water. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so this poem is called Don't Quit. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will... Quick slurp. Do you remember that cook who used to cook on television? We went to... He was a Christian. We went to hear him in South Minster. And he'd have a glass of wine. I can't think of his name. Great, yeah. <laughs> so when things go wrong, as they sometimes will, that's water, by the way. <laughs> when the road you're trudging seems uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, debts are high, and you want to smile, but you have to sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't quit. Often the goal is nearer, it seems, to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up, when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night slipped down <coughs> how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out and the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you can never tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your hardest hit. It's when things seem worse that you mustn't quit. And, you know, that is a good thing not to quit, isn't it? To press on, to carry on, to run the race. Sometimes our, in our own strength, man's efforts can be futile. We can try really hard and we can burn ourselves out. But, you know, the strength, the joy of the Lord is our strength this morning. 
Moses was sent to the Israelites and they refused to listen to him, to God. And the fact we know we need a personal relationship to God. C.S. Lewis quotes, there are far, far better things ahead than we may leave behind. And I believe that's for us. The next word I'd like to speak on a little bit is adoration, which is adore. You adore if you adore somebody, you, you love and respect them, and you revere them. I remember as well once when you, you might be thinking, how do I pray and how do I start to pray? I think they call it uh, an acrostic, where you would use parts of a word to try and remember. And I've got the word acts, and the first word is, is adoration, and that's why I put that in there. So we come to God and we say, Lord, we adore you, we praise you, we bless your name. Then C for confession, we confess that you are Lord, Lord of my life. Thanksgiving, we give thanks to him and supplication. But it's a good way to hand, uh, to, to pray. In Matthew, we'll be shortly coming to Christmas, if I dare mention it already. But they saw his star and they came to worship him. And the Greek word for worship, or one of the Greek words, is proskuneo, which uh, means to adore. So they came to adore the king. I always remember the song from Christmas, O come let us adore him and worship Christ the Lord. I want to briefly touch on, on, on Caleb. Um, Caleb, it was said about Caleb that he, he had a man with a different spirit and I suppose I used to think, yeah, that was the spirit of God. But no, it was about his spirit inside him, that he had a different spirit and he had a good attitude. And when we come wholeheartedly before the Lord with our good attitude, God is with us. You know, Caleb was born, yeah, good idea, I suppose he was born. <laughs> he lived 40 years as a slave and uh, would help with the products, uh, sort of the building products, uh, projects that were there. Um, Names in the Bible often mean something. Now Moses' name was mean that he, he, he was to draw out, because he was drawn out of the, the basket in the, the waters of the Nile. Peter's name means rock, because Jesus said, Messiah, upon this rock, Jesus will build his church. But you know Caleb, and we might ask, uh, now that's what's his name, Jeff Uniah, why he called him Caleb, because Caleb meant dog. And I would imagine that we, what we would come to the conclusion is, because he was a slave and he was uh, sort of a slave and bought in that time, that they were treated like dogs. But Caleb carried on to see the salvation of God. He was one of the 12 leaders that went into um, uh, to you know, look out of the land. And 10 came back with bad reports, but he was one that came back with a good report. Caleb said... Yes, the people are big, but the God of Israel is bigger and is more powerful. So we come to this conclusion, either we have big problems and a small God, or we have a big God and we have small problems. It was no flash in the plan how uh, Caleb acted. Secondly, Caleb was faithful and he was in it for the long haul, because then he was in the land another 40 years, so he got to 85 he, he didn't recline to the sofa and think, oh, now let the, look, the young ones take over and I'll watch what they do. But he carried on. You know, we can attempt great things for God. He had a positive spirit. He was strong but flexible. And he didn't have fear and anxiety. Fear, I always remember, I don't know where I heard it from, again and across it, but false expectations appearing real. And how true it is sometimes that... Uh, False things come along and you think, well, why did I fear about it in the end of the day? F President Franklin Roosevelt wrote in a memorable address, 1933, wasn't there. <laughs> Let me assert that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And sometimes it can become really fear. But without fear, it enables us to relieve our faith. So I just want to encourage you this morning with those thoughts Allow, let's allow God to restore us, let, allow God to bring us back, let's be devoted, let's do not quit, let's have faith in God, because I believe God is doing a new thing in our lives and in the church. Lift, Lord, I pray this morning that you will lift up the arms of the weak people in church. Lord, thank you for your presence.
lift up the arms of the weak. Help us to do that. Help us, Lord, to love the unlovable. Help us, Lord, to feed the hungry. And we're just so glad that we're part of your kingdom and your kingdom rules. So I want to encourage you this morning with the words from the Bible. Don't quit. Let's restore ourselves that God has a better future for us and for us individually. And God will bless us as we worship him. Amen.
left to prove. There's nothing left to prove. He freely gave it to us. this morning so uh, we've had Paul thank you Paul that was wonderful absolutely amazing I think you should be applauded for that it was brilliant uh, good morning everyone I'm here to raise a few questions in your mind just to help you think a little bit um, Paul you already shared uh, but this week you get two for the price of one there you go a few weeks ago in the email that we sent out we raised a question for you um, that have you ever heard the phrase short-term pain for long-term gain well, as I said, I was reading a book that offered a, a slight twist on the words, but a whole different meaning to them. Was it about short-term pain or long-term glory? Let me just read a short extract, a short extract from a book. A book by, oh, sorry. A book by John Andrews. And it tells the story of uh, uh, the marathon and how the marathon came about. It says... Just focus, because I haven't got my glasses on. Uh, when the Persian army landed at Marathon, a guy called Pheidippides, I think I've spelled, uh, pronounced that right, was sent to Sparta to ask for help to repel the invaders. He ran 150 miles in just two days. So, Lily, I think you've been going to your keep fit class. 150 miles in two days is not bad going. Uh, by the time the Spartans arrived at Marathon, the Athenian army had won the battle without their help, and the Pheidippides was sent to Athens with news of the victory. He ran a further 22 miles without stopping and then breathlessly delivered the message, Rejoice, we conquer, just before he collapsed and died. <laughs> Sorry. There's always got to be a negative of this story, hasn't there? So, rejoice, we conquer. Um, he probably died from heat exhaustion or something like that, but... Absolutely amazing story, a guy who could do that just for that one, that one phrase, rejoice we conquer, what an amazing God. So now, that is something, that is someone who, prepared, who was prepared to sacrifice his now for the future. He, was, he had a vision, his was a vision and a, and a passion beyond the natural, 
that caused him to run that 150 miles just to say those, those words. It was beyond the natural, which allowed him to make those decisions at such a great personal cost. We live in a world that these days, as we've already said, is all about the short-term gain. We talk about things like the X Factor and, and Strictly and all of these talent competitions that are constantly on the television, promising instant fame and fortune to the winners. But so often, that instant gratification and the thrill of the winning is fleeting and, and over in, in, in a very twinkling of an eye. Now, sports stars may be the hero one week. Mr. Ronaldo might be the hero one week. And he might be the villain the next. Bit of a disappointing result yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we won't say any more. Anyway, however, the word of God says in 1 John 2, verse 17, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Today, as I promised, I'm going to try very much try and follow up a little bit more on the subject um, and give you a little bit more information around that. So there is a phrase that just keeps going around in my head that we have to be in this for the long haul. It is a long haul battle. Our Christian walk is always a long haul. As church, we should push on for the long-term glory. We are, and I will repeat it, Gordon, wakey, wakey, we are on the victory side. We are on the victory side. It might not always seem it, but we are on the victory side. And if sometimes don't, things don't seem to be going the right way for you, just remember, keep on keeping on. I'm going to give you seven suggestions. And this all harks back to a guy that I knew when I was 13. Um, I've got so many people to thank for um, caring for me in, in my Christian walk throughout my life. But this guy, um, his name was Sid, I don't even know his surname, but he had a major impact on my life when I was 13. And he gave me these seven suggestions. He didn't just give them to me, he gave them to a camp of about 100 guys, but 100 boys. But it was as though he was talking to me. And I'm going to try and hang my suggestions on what he said, but also on the term, we fly long haul. When, so when we fly, when we fly to Australia or somewhere or to America... We fly long haul. Okay, so why long haul? Because when we walk this Christian walk, it's not all about the instant wins. But as we heard from Paul talking about Caleb and visiting the promised land as a spy, uh, and he was still there to enter the promised land all those years later. And it says in, in Numbers 14, So the men Moses had sent to explore the land, who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report about it, these men who were responsible for spreading the bad report about the land were struck down and died of a plague before the Lord. But of the men who went up to explore the land, only Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh survived. Caleb was a man for the long haul, and we should be too. So, if you had plans for flying to the US, as I believe some people do soon, Brenda? Yeah? Or even further afield, this could be for your benefit. So just pin back your, your tabbles. Um, these are, there's going to be some suggestions that you might find useful for flying in the long haul in the natural, but also for flying in the long haul spiritually. So my first suggestion is eat wisely. So eat wisely. In the natural, when you fly long haul, you're advised to go for certain foods. You're advised to go for the healthy, the carb-rich foods, such as whole grain bread. Remember this whole grain bread? an oatmeal to keep your blood sugars low. These foods make it easy to cope with things like jet lag. Another healthy, healthy snack idea is maybe protein-rich nibbles. You could pack cheese or yogurt if you're allowed to, or even protein bars, because they'll boost your energy and keep you full for longer. So it's always better to stay away from the heavy meals before or during your flight, because these are tougher for your body to digest. Hope you're learning something here. But in our Christian walk, we also need to eat wisely. We have to eat wisely. I'm not going to stand up here and lecture you about eating certain foods because, as my wife knows, I don't always eat the healthiest unless she's putting food in front of me. Um, but I am talking about having wisdom in all, the thing, in all things and avoiding obvious and foolish ways. In 1 Corinthians 13 11, it says, When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child and I reasoned like a child. When I became a man... I put the ways of childhood behind me. Number two, 
Hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Take on water. Health experts recommend drinking plenty of fluids, especially water, throughout your flight because air travel can be incredibly dehydrating. Plus, staying hydrated can help with fighting your, your flight flu. Try saying that when you've had uh, something not to drink. Uh, <laughs> but it can help you fight with flight flu once you land. It is so important that as church we hydrate, 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 that we come to the one who is the water of life. Life springs up from the well who is Jesus. Again, we read in John chapter 4 that when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who is it, it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I will give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring in them of water welling up for eternal life. So we all need that well of living water within our lives. We need to hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Number three, wear comfortable clothing. Don't try and wear somebody else's clothes. Don't try and wear something that isn't yours. Don't be the guy in, suit, in, in the suit who's flying economy that Glenn talked about the other week. Maybe you've experienced a long flight where you went from freezing to sweating and back again. Remember, loose-fitting clothing and a few breathable layers can help you manage the difference in temperatures that you'll experience during the flight and between the terminal and the aircraft. Nobody wants to spend seven hours with a, a seatbelt cutting into your midriff and, and you're feeling uncomfortable. Life, likewise, for our Christian life, it's important to wear the right clothing to find the role that is you. Not everyone's a life group leader. Not everyone can work with the homeless. Not everyone is good practically, but everyone can do something. There is a role for everyone. What's more, don't try and copy the person next to you. Mason, don't try and be a Lily. <laughs> Lily, don't be an Edna. You are you. You are who God has made you to be. It's so important to know that. So recognize your skills, recognize your talents like you, like you should. Like the clothes that you wear, they won't always be the same as the person next to you, hopefully. Number four, as well as comfortable clothing, also think comfy shoes. Think about the, whose shoes you're walking in. When flying, your ankles will probably tend to swell and... and uh, yeah, they'll tr probably tend to blow up a little bit. This happens because you're sitting with your feet on the floor for a long period of time. So choose your shoes wisely to help relieve that foot swelling during a long flight. Flex and extend your legs frequently when seated. Shift your positions and take a short walk around every couple of hours. There is a song that we sing by Matt Redman. We've not sung it this morning, but we do sing it every so often. And it goes, standing on this mountain top looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step, you were there with us, kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing that every victory was your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say, never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own, because you are faithful, God, you are faithful. What an amazing song, what if we took the time to actually take in those words that we sing so often, we would just be amazed at the songwriter's talents because they just encapsulate everything that we, we need to say. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own. And it, There's one bit towards the end. It says, every step we are breathing in your grace. Evermore we'll be breathing out your praise. And I just want that in my life. I want to... Breathe in the grace of God and then breathe out his praise because you're faithful, God. You're faithful. No, we don't walk alone. We should walk in his footsteps because they're comfortable footsteps. They're, they're the way we should go. We're not, we're not walking against the tide, but we're walking with him. And you'll find the shoes are the most comfortable 
when they're your own, not somebody else's. I pray that for all of us at home and online, that with every footstep that we take, we will recall that we are saved only by God's grace. And as we breathe out, as we exhale, we will only praise him. Number five. I hope you're still remembering these, Brenda. Sleep. I'm sure you're good at sleep. We all need to take rest. We've already heard about we've already heard about rest and taking rest and but we need to take it and we also need to let other people take it. We need to let people have a rest sometimes. It's important to get sleep. It's even if it's a short nap on a long haul journey. Sure it's not easy when you're you're on a crowded plane, I'm sure when there are a bit of uh, noise around you, maybe from the young children or whatever. But, but take a neck pillow or, or an eye mask or, or earphones or something just to blot out the noise and so that you may wake up and, and not be stressed out. And thinking about the need for rest in connection with our lives, what good is anyone in a state of exhaustion? We're not. So we need that rest. We need to allow other people to have rest sometimes. Number six, coming towards the end, coming in coming into land. So do something. Take a book, maybe, or, or a computer tablet or, or magazines or, or something to help pass the time during your flight because if you're on a plane for seven hours, it's quite a long time. So this could be the right time to catch up on maybe the, less, the best episodes of, I don't know, whatever, what's been on the telly recently, Vigil. Just take, take, take the time to watch these programs and, and to, to see what God's saying through them because very often there is a theme in there that you can pick out there is a Christian theme. I don't know whether the, the writers always intend it, but you can see the triumph of good over evil in many of these things. So look out for them, or, or maybe listen to your Spotify playlist or whatever. Just make sure that you download load some out online content to your, your device so you don't have to pay for the in-flight Wi-Fi. So what's that saying? Um, your mum always used to say when you were younger, if you've got nothing to do, was it? The devil makes works for, for lazy hands. I can still hear it now. My mum used to say it echoes around in my head. Uh, perhaps a better way to look at it is if you want to, to feel involved, then get involved. There is always something that needs doing. Surely it's better to be a part of things than to stand on the outside looking in. I would even say it is better to do something wrong than, it's, than, than to do nothing at all. Um, I, I found a, a verse in, in James chapter 1. It says, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. And then again in, in verse 26 of the same chapter of James. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you're fooling yourself. And your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Again, that brings us on to the theme of the shoeboxes that Lynette was talking about. So all these things just join together. So number seven, my final point. At last, you say. So for living long haul, my final point, number seven, for living long haul is to stay positive. Going on a long haul trip can be stressful and exhausting, but it's well worth it once you get there. When you arrive at your final destination, Stay positive. Instead of dreading the flight, find ways to use that time productively. And it's just so in our Christian walk. There are frustrating times. We all know there are frustrating times. Let's be honest, there are frustrating times. Times when things don't go quite right. But remember, we must be in it for the long haul. We're all called to look out for each other. Wouldn't it be great to echo the, walls, the words of Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 12? where it says, as I shared last night in the email, when we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. Think long haul, not short-term gain, but long-term glory. Amen. I just want to, I was reminded at John's funeral on Monday, uh, Glenn said something about, we never say thank you to the people while they're still alive. And I've got so many people, excuse me, not used to this, It's not me. I don't cry. Um, 
that I've got so many people to be thankful for in my life. And uh, before I came in this morning, I, I was jotting them down. And there are too many people I want to say thank you to, but they've enabled me to live a long haul life that I've I committed my life to to God when I was 13. And I, I just I wrote some names down, names of many people who have passed away. Sorry. You may know some of them. You probably won't know, well, you probably won't know most of them. But people like Michael and Maureen Coop. It must be something about standing up with his microphone in your hand. <laughs> uh, uh, Michael and Maureen Coop and their sons, Richard and Steve. Stuart and Wendy Shepley. There's a guy called Rex Thorpe. got to do this because it's so important for me. There's a guy called Greg Hallett. He was a year older than me. Sorry. He was in the year above me at school, but he passed away last year. But he started the Christian Union at school. And he enabled me to stay close to God at a time when I could so easily have fallen away. There's Martin and Mandy. There's a teacher called Phil Robinson. There's a guy called Mark Halliday. Numerous camp leaders, numerous youth leaders. All people who supported me at different times. Paul and Jill. You guys. My wife, Julie. John O'Donovan. Could go on and on and on. But everyone has just had a place in my life when it was right and enabled me to walk that walk for the last 45 years knowing that God is in the centre of my life. And it is so important you find somebody to cling on to, somebody who can hold on to, somebody who can hold you in that relationship with God. So I can see a 10 on each of your heads, as I said last night in the email. Each of you has got a 10 on your heads. I'm rooting for you. I want the very best for you. And I believe God does too. We're going to hear from Lily now. Lily's just going to, to pray over us as we, as we go out of this meeting today. And I believe that she's going to pray, and it's going to be an anointed prayer, that she's going to, to bring something more into what we've shared this morning. So I'm sorry about the tears. I'm, that's not me at all. Last time I cried was at my own dad's funeral, so that's um, and <laughs> eight, ten, eight ten, ten years ago, something like that. But God does move upon you sometimes, so... Thank you. Thanks, Lily. One, two. What a wonderful, wonderful morning we've had. We've heard so much about the love of God, how the rest of he restores us. He's faithful. He never leaves us. We serve an awesome God. How blessed are we? to be able to call him Father, to be able to stand here in freedom and say, we love you, Lord. We praise you. We worship you. We give you thanks in this and in all things. We thank you for the family we've got here, the family we've got online. We just are so grateful this morning. We praise you, Lord. We thank you that you restore us. You love us. You care for us. 
And we thank you, Father God, and we pray a touch upon the lives of all of those who are not here this morning, who need a touch from you, Lord. You know what touch they need far more than any of us do. So I pray, Father God, that you do your work. Your will be done in the lives of all of those who need that love and touch from you, Father God. I pray that they reach out to you. And we thank you, Lord, as we go through the week, we will take on the nourishment and the fluid and the hydration of your word from your Bible that we praise you, we worship you, we read your word. We use the lamp and the light of the word on our feet to follow you where you want us to go. Let us be obedient, faithful, and open to the love of God this week and to be what we can be to the people in our lives, to our families, to our friends. Reach out, touch those who need. Be a friend, be an ear, be a shoulder. Thank you, Father God, for the lovely morning we've had. We praise you, we worship you, we give you thanks, now and always. And we pray that Glenn and Margaret have a lovely time where they are, and we miss them. And Lord, be with them all and the family as we go into this week, love and praising and worshiping you, now and always. Amen. Amen. Tea and coffee served in the, in the dining room. Enjoy. Be with, spend a, spend a moment with everybody. Thank you. God bless.